Hi, I'm Tim. Join me in this video as I go through five true aviation tales that you may not have heard about, but they're all true, believe it or not. Let's get to it. This video is a little bit of a takeoff of the old Ripley's Believe It or Not a series where um, Ripley would describe unusual things happening throughout the world. What I'm going to do is go through five true aviation tales that I think are pretty interesting, not, not widely known, but actually happened. So let's get with it. In this video, I'll cover the Boeing 314 Clipper that was unable to turn on takeoff. I will discuss the British clipping the wings of Corsair fighter aircraft for use in World War II and why they did that. I'll give you the very interesting tale of what General Paul Tibbetts did to convince pilots who were too scared to fly the B-29 during World War II what to do to get into the aircraft. Quite interesting story in World War II of um, Piper Cubs flying off of landing ship tank ships during World War II. And finally, we'll end up with the interesting story of the Bristol Brabazon, a huge aircraft uh, built by the British right after World War II. The first tale is on the Boeing 314 Clipper. Uh, the Boeing 314 was a huge airplane at the time. It was built in the mid-30s, uh, engine service in 1938. It was a four-engine flying boat that was designed originally to fly across the Atlantic uh, from uh, the US to the UK. There's great difficulty negotiating um, landing rights with the British, so instead Pan Am decided to fly it um, across the Pacific. And over six days, the 314 would fly from California through Hawaii, various islands in the Pacific, to Manila, and finally Hong Kong, doing a journey in six days that before, before would take about four weeks by ship. Uh, so it was a large airplane at the time. It would carry about 40 passengers at 150 miles an hour. The flight from California to Hawaii took 19 hours. That's five hours today by jet airliner, but it did the job. And it's a beautiful aircraft, um, just very nice service inside. Uh, it's almost like a flying ship with the aircraft. But you notice the Boeing 314 has uh, three tails, okay? However, the initial version that rolled out of the factory um, in Washington State only had a single large tail. Well, that plane was on its test flight, of course, a low fuel load to make sure that it can get off the water and fly properly. The test pilot, once they got took off and tried to turn uh, about 2,000 feet, he declared that I'm unable to turn the aircraft. I, I do not have the ability to turn this aircraft. The rudders were just completely ineffective. And so what he did, the use of ailerons and differential power, he managed to turn the aircraft 180 degrees in a 10 mile arc. While they were on that test flight, the plane was unpressurized, of course, back then. They had various access panels. One of the test engineers on that flight went to the aft uh, section of the airplane, opened up an access uh, hatch, poked his head over the top surface of the tail of the aircraft and realized there was no relative wind. It just, it was like calm. They, they could not feel the airflow going over the top of the fuselage. Just the way that the wings were built, the sponsons underneath, the whole layout of the aircraft, it blocked the proper airfoil over that large rudder in the back. And if the rudder can't see airflow, it, it is not effective. So they managed to get the airplane down in one piece. Of course, it's landing on the water. You don't have to find a runway. The initial attempt was put on two tails that caused a very uh, uncomfortable uh, motion in the air. They eventually went on three tails. They kept the central fin. They put two outboard fins, so those uh, rudder sections were completely in the airflow of the engines, and the plane worked fine after that. So that, no matter what you do with your studies, wind tunnel testing, it completely escaped them. That plane had no airflow over the rudder. An interesting footnote to the 314, Boeing wound up building 12 of these aircraft. Um, three were lost in crashes. Only one of the crashes resulted in fatalities. But they only served for about three years because in 1941, the US entered World War II, the planes were all taken up by the Navy uh, for use for VIP transfer, transport in support of the war. And so for all that work, all that effort, um, the planes only threw, flew passengers for three years. And another thing that's interesting, a one-way ticket from San Francisco to Hong Kong in 1938 cost $950 back then. Today, that ticket would be approximately $20,000. Today, you can get a ticket for that same flight for well under $1,500.
The next subject I'll talk about is the F4U Corsair. Um, so the Corsair, when the U.S. entered World War II in, after the December 7th attacks in 1941, the F4F Wildcat was our pr primary fighter at the time, and it served with distinction for the first two years of the war as the U.S. quickly developed more advanced uh, fighters, uh, specifically the F6F Hellcat and the F4U Corsair. Both of those aircraft used 2,000 horsepower engine, which were huge engines at the time. When the Corsair was being built, when it was originally turned over to the Navy about 1942, as you can see from the pictures, it had a very long nose and the cockpit was far back and the pilot sat fairly low. The Navy, it was just a, it was a, it was a monster of an airplane. And the Navy during flight test, it had stall problems. There was uh, issues of the landing gear bouncing um, on the carrier. But the big problem was the pilots just couldn't safely land the aircraft on carriers because they couldn't see past that nose. It just wasn't considered safe at the time. The Hellcat came along, uh, designed by Grumman. Uh, that, the Hellcat was optimized for um, carrier operations. They actually brought in Wildcat pilots to comment on the design. So it was a very uh, good plane to handle for carrier operations. A little bit slower than the Corsair. So the decision was made to take the Corsair, give it to the Marines because they were flying off of land bases at the time and figure out what to do with the Corsair while the Hellcat was taking the fight to the uh, Japanese at the time. About this time, 1943, the British were in very desperate straits because they did not have a suitable fighter for carrier operations. The idea of the Brits was that carrier-based aircraft would see bombers or flying boats, non-maneuverable aircraft. So you needed two people in your carrier-based aircraft for the navigation uh, duties, and you weren't going to be doing any fighter-type activities. That was a mistake, but that was a view at the time. So the British uh, converted some Spitfires and Hurricanes to carrier duty. They just didn't have the range suitable for carrier operations. So what the British did was they started buying Corsairs from the U.S. because that was the only game in town. The British considered it a dangerous aircraft for landing on their carriers. The British carriers are typically smaller than U.S. carriers. But what the British did was they um, modified the canopy to make it a little bit bigger, raised the seat seven inches. They, the British came up with a very interesting technique. Instead of just lining up on final and going in to land on the carrier, we can't see it over the nose, they flew these curving approaches the whole way to keep the carrier in sight. Then at the last minute, would just line up and land on the carrier. It took tremendous piloting skill to do this, but the British did that. The thing about clipping the wings, the on certain classes of British carriers, below deck, so they did the maintenance on the aircraft, the wingtips folded up. There was insufficient headspace. The wings would scrape against the roof of the hangar. The British literally clipped eight inches off of each wingtip of their Corsairs, so the wings were folded. It would fit underneath the hangar deck, and that worked. And ironically enough, by clipping off the um, eight inches off of uh, each wingtip, it helped the airplane land a little bit firmer, uh, and it was better suited for carrier operations. So it was. Kind of amazing that in the middle of World War II, you cut eight inches off of each wing tip of a fighter and it worked out for the best. The next story that's of interest is regards the B-29 bomber of World War II. Uh, when the U.S. entered World War II in December 7, 1941, really the only four-engine long-range bomber we had that was in production uh, was the B-17. The B-24 B was coming along, but the B-17 was a, a very main focus of bombers. The problem was the B-17 at the entry of the war was essentially obsolete on day one. It was unpressurized. Depending on the length of the mission, it could only carry about 5,000 pounds of bombs. That's not a lot of bomb load for what you need to do in World War II. And being unpressurized, you're on oxygen the whole time. It's very cold at altitude, but that was all we had. So right after the entry into World War II, the Army Air Corps knew they needed a more advanced bomber. They put out the specification for the B-29. The Army initially bought uh, 250 of these aircraft. It was just a paper aircraft. No engineering had been done. But it was a huge advance. You were going to have uh, much larger engines. It was going to be pressurized for the first time. Uh, the guns were remotely um, operated. Uh, they were electrical turrets. It was just a very advanced design. It was an expensive design. To build the atomic bomb in World War II, World War II the Manhattan Project, that cost about $1.9 To develop the B-29, 
cost $3 billion. In today's money, that'd be $45 billion. It was the most expensive developmental pro uh, program of the war. And they, uh, they just ran into problems continuously. And the engines were a huge part of the problems because they were such large, powerful engines, tightly cowled to go long distances. They just didn't get sufficient cooling air. The engines caught on fire. And it got to be such a problem that um, uh, that um, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who was called upon to organize the unit that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945, as he was organizing and his group to fly the airplane, learn how to fly the airplane, there were pilots that just refused to fly the B-29 because they said, we're going to get killed. This plane will catch on fire, will crash, and we just don't want to fly it. So Tibbetts had to do something about this. What he did was he found some woman pilots to, to fly the B-29 to essentially shame the male pilots into flying. Women, of course, in World War II could not fly aircraft in combat, but the women were completely capable of flying aircraft. So what happened was the women's were part of the um, WASP, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. It was a group of women that were qualified to fly basically every plane we had from fighters to bombers. So when they were built in the United States, they would ferry them overseas to the um, operational theaters for the men to fly them in combat. So the women were very qualified pilots. Paul found two of these women, and just let me get the names right. It was Dora Dorothy Strother and Dorothea Johnson Mormon. Uh, these were two uh, women unknown to him. They were recommended by, by to him. They were exceptional pilots. Uh, Paul gave them a three-day checkout in this uh, B-29, first time they'd flown fortune aircraft on one of the checkout flights. They actually, two of the engines did catch on fire, smoke um, filled the cockpit, they landed successfully. And what the women did was they put up a series of air demonstrations for the male pilots as they would fly in the B-29 and take them up for a ride. And they basically, the men after that, just they, they started flying the B-29 because of, uh, because of that. What was kind of interesting, once higher headquarters found out about this, uh, Air Staff Major General Barney uh, uh, Giles told um, Tibbetts that the women were putting the big football players to shame and Tibbetts had to shut down the program. They went back to flying um, the delivery of the aircraft. But it's an interesting footnote because on the B-29s, the U.S. built about 4,970 B-29s. That's a lot of aircraft. These are, these are huge, complex aircraft. In the history of all that B-29, there were three women qualified to fly them. The two that I mentioned with um, Paul Tibbetts, later Brigadier General Tibbetts. There's actually a third one after. Let me, let me get this name right uh, also. It is Debbie Travis King. Uh, she's the only other, the third, the last and final woman to be uh, so far to be qualified to fly the B-29. She was checked out by the FAA, and she was qualified to fly FIFI, which is the Confederate, uh, excuse me, the Commemorative Air Forces um, B-29 that they fly around to air shows. So she is the third uh, B-20 female B-29 pilot. Of the 4,970 B-29s built, three, uh, two are airworthy today, FIFI and another one named Doc. So uh, an interesting story about women B-29 pilots. During World War II, obviously there were a range of aircraft used in that effort. And one thing that has struck me is the um, L3 or the um, Piper Cub. And the um, Piper Cub was brought into the Army. They called them L4, the L4 liaison. And they were liaison aircraft and they would be frequently used for artillery crews to spot where their rounds were hitting on the ground, do other observation tasks. The Army had bought about 4,900 of these Piper Cubs to be used in World War II. It's just amazing the numbers. And they did tremendous work because while well, they didn't have a lot of range and they were slow, they were Piper Cubs, they could land and take off just about anywhere. They didn't need fancy airfields and they were invaluable for radio radioing back to the artillery crews where their rounds were falling. The problem was oftentimes um, combat troops needed their services before they had secured a beachhead, before they had land in which to build um, uh, airstrips for these aircraft. So the question is what to do. There were not aircraft carriers available for this. So what they did was an enterprising um, couple of army officers partnered with the Navy and they had the Navy had these um, ships called LSTs, they were landing ship tanks. And let me get the numbers on them just to be correct. 
uh, they would carry about um, uh, these L uh, LSTs would carry about 160 sailors or Marines. They were big ships. Some were 328 feet long. They would have seven officers and 104 sailors. And there was a lot of them. There were so many out there, very often the Navy would not even give a name to them. They just give numbers. And so these crews realized that, geez, maybe we could build a short deck and the Piper Cubs can land and take off on these ships. Sure enough, they did that. Uh, they build uh, these um, uh, very temporary runways for two, uh, about 210 feet long that allow the planes to take off and recover onto the ship so they could support combat activities before there were any land bases established. The ships would typically carry between four and um, ten of these Piper Cubs and they would just be lifted up onto the ramp to do their operations. Of course, once the beachheads were secured, the planes would take off and land on the shore. But that's just an interesting case of just what pilots were doing when the need arose. Piper Cub, you get pretty comfortable, ship going into the wind, the landing speed of 40 knots or so, you're touching down pretty slow, but that's what they did. The final story is a Bristol Type 167 Brabazon. The Brabazon was a huge airliner developed by the British right after World War II. The Brits uh, built a tremendous number of aircraft during World War II, focusing on fighters. It was clear after the war there was going to be a large market for air transport around the world for these four-engine airplanes that were developed during World War II. And what the interesting thing was, when the British were, designed, were just trying to figure out what type of airplane to build, they wanted to build a very big airplane. They did this with the Brabazon. The fuselage, it's a, it's a double-decker airplane, the fuselage diameter is 25 feet. To give you an idea how big 25 feet is for a diameter, a 747's diameter is 20 feet. So this is 5 feet larger diameter than a 747. But the problem the Brits made was a couple. First of all, they saw the market as very wealthy, influential people flying, much like first-class uh, ship passengers. So the Brabazon was designed for around 80 to 100 passengers. Uh, you had very spacious cabins for each of the passengers. You had a 36-person movie theater in the airplane, dining rooms, cocktail lounges. It was just a very few number of people in a very large airplane. The other thing that was a problem was at the time, in the late 1940s, jet engines existed, but they were very primitive, not reliable, noisy, using a ton of fuel jet engines, but they had a future. Uh, the Brabazon was designed with piston-powered engines, not turboprops, piston-powered engines. The picture looks like it has, it has four propellers. It looks like four engines, four nacelles. There's really two engines for each prop that are uh, powered by an angled drive shaft into this incredibly complex gearbox to power the propeller. Uh, there's the counter-rotating propellers for this engine. The Brits tend to like complexity in their aircraft designs with this power arrangement, so here we go. The plane was built, uh, it flew successfully a couple of years, but as airlines looked at the economics, the speed, and the cost of a ticket, after that one aircraft was built, it was eventually destroyed. It just never entered commercial service. Nobody ever bought it. So it's an interesting example of just um, the inability to foresee what the um, passenger loans would be. That plane probably should have been designed for about 300 people, let alone 80 people, and the need to perhaps do turboprops, but the future was jet engines. And of course, the Americans were doing that with the B-47, KC-135, 707 in the mid-1950s that eventually um, uh, overtook the, the global uh, market for transport aircraft. So thank you for joining me in this video. I think it's a kind of interesting view of five aviation tales that are not well known, believe it or not, and I look forward to seeing you on future videos of this nature. Thank you for tuning in.